I think we're at a moment in time where we're coming out of the pandemic and there are a handful of things going on. I want to emphasize it's clearly a transition. Um, we need thoughtful policy. So we've seen the UK as a tremendous opportunity for us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Wednesday, 20th of October. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The UK inflation rate eases but remains above target. A drop in the price of eating out offsets some of a surge in transportation costs. Bitcoin nears an all-time high as demand surges for the first U.S. ETF linked to the cryptocurrency. And the LME also takes action. The exchange steps and try to restore order to the copper market after inventories hit a 47-year low last week. So first of all, let's check in on the markets. Quite a lot going on actually today. Just because of earnings, a bit of concern about inflation once again weighing on some of these stocks. The focus is not only on inflationary pressure but a repricing of the yield curve. We're seeing similar losses. Are they losses? They seem unchanged but the price is of course pressure downwards we also had earnings with a bit of margins focus so European stock 600 uh, you can see down a little bit but really a lot of the action is on some of these bonds and then aluminium futures down some 3.8 percent let's have a look at Europe and uh, some of the indices that we're seeing there of course a lot of the focus is also what's happening in the London Metals Exchange and the fact that they're changing some of, of the rules now in terms of the groups look they're a little bit volatile I think staples are still on the higher side the foot may be gaining some 0.2 percent and you can see the UK we also had some inflation forecasts um, here on the CAC 40 down some 0.2 percent so equity trading mixed across the continent that's after the S&P is closed or has closed in on a record high as traders come to terms with supply chain snarls and higher commodity prices now a decent start to third quarter earnings also boosting investor sentiment the Goldman Sachs chief executive David Solomon told us he's got a close eye on the trends I think we're at a moment in time where we're coming out of the pandemic and there are a handful of things going on. I think all over the world there are labor issues that are really a reflection of this transition out of the pandemic. There are supply chain issues. Uh, some of this stuff is transitory. There are some secular trends that we have to watch closely. Um, but I think we're adjusting and, 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 and dealing with it as anybody else is. Well, joining us to discuss the markets is our FX and rates editor, Christina Aquino. Christina, I have a million, first of all, good morning. Good I have morning. a million question, actually, on treasuries and the yield curve repricing. How much more of a repricing will we see? Well, you know, Fran, I think now investors are waiting for the data, right? That's kind of the next catalyst because they've priced in their expectations for rate hikes in the UK, in New Zealand, and even in the US. And so now the question is, is the data going to back this up? And so, you know, this is where your inflation readings are going to be really important. Your PMI readings are going to be really important because these are kind of your forward looks into the rest of the year, into the next couple of months and seeing what businesses on the ground are really seeing in terms of costs, how much the central banks will have to respond to this. Is this an imminent threat um, in some places? Some central bankers have it, have acknowledged that it is a threat that they need to respond to, like in the UK, but then other central bankers are still claiming it's transitory. So now the data will really be the verdict for whether market bets are correct in anticipating more rate hikes or central bankers are correct in saying that it's still transitory. I mean, I want to ask you about Bitcoin because Bitcoin, first of all, there was a really cryptic tweet by Jack Dorsey. I mean, I saw it and I was like, wait, what is that level? Like, what exactly? So, and, and it's about mining. But then there's also FOMO of people that say, well, I, you know, I want to be part of this, especially as there's a uh, ETF Bitcoin that's coming up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very buzzy space, particularly now, right? I think I like ETF, that buzzy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. I mean, there, there's a lot of buzz right now because, as you say, the ETF creation and, you know, it's kind of creating once again this kind of uh, attention on it because, it, you know, the, the implications of the ETF means that, oh, maybe more investors can access it. There could be more legitimacy to the way it's being regulated and controlled. And, you know, it's not going to be such a treacherous uh, sort of investment anymore. You know, your your institutional funds, your mom and pops would be a lot safer investing in it. I mean, th these are all kind of the, the thinking probably that, that's going through markets at the moment. And that's why we're, we're seeing a lot of um, attention on it. Now, whether those actually come to fruition and whether these investors um, do, in fact, are, are able to capitalize on mm -hmm. the gains that we've seen in the past. I mean, it's gone up quite a bit. Quite a lot. 
had a lot of gyrations, right? With a lot of volatility. I feel watched, because actually uh, David Solomon kind of pops up b between us from time to time, because we had a conversation yesterday on crypto and inflation and things like that. W when are we settled on inflation? Ah. Uh. I don't think the million that, dollar question. Exactly, the million dollar question. Honestly, I think, you know, it's going to be a debate for a little while because I think we, we've spoken about this before, right? There's still kind of that tension between um, people on the ground, bankers, and even your regular consumers crying that prices are <laughs> rising. You know, it's being, it's, it's gotten harder to afford my weekly grocery shop, you know, when, when you speak to people in the ground. But then when central bankers are looking at it from a top down view, they're not just kind of looking at the, the, and, and I think this is what's fueling a transitory debate, right? They, they want to look at it in aggregate, and they mm -hmm. want to look if this is something that persists over time. And, yeah, yeah and until that kind of debate, um, it, the, the gap between those two camps gets a little bit closer, I think this, this debate is going to rage on for a little while. And so you have to kind of make a bet on whether you trust the bonds or, you know, the bond market or whether you believe the central banks. I mean, is it as simple as that? I mean, you could boil it down to that, yes. And, you know, I think it is the perennial tension between markets and central banks where you have markets really pricing and really pushing for one way, right? It's, it's kind of a one-way bet right now, the fact that rate hikes are coming, especially in places like the U.K. and New Zealand, right? And, you know, in, in some ways, the gap here between markets and central banks is a little bit closer because uh, the Bank of England itself, Governor Andrew Bailey himself, ha has laid out that groundwork to say that we are going to be doing this pretty soon and the big shock is going to be if they don't end up doing it and so I think at least in the UK that gap between markets and central banks is a little bit closer other places not as much it's still quite a wide gap and so um, yeah I think again it boils down to the data right it's probably what investors and central banks are going to be looking to to see is this gap getting any closer in terms of market expectations and central banks but yeah that's, uh, that's still the debate. <laughs> Christine, <laughs> it still is. Thank you so much, our FX and rates editor, Christine Aquino. Now, coming up, what opportunities could COP26 present to energy and infrastructure companies? Well, we talked to the chief financial officer of one of the titans in the space, Bechtel chief financial officer, Catherine Hunt Ryan, is coming up next. And then coming up a little bit later this hour, we'll also speak to Anne Fanukin, its vice chair of Bank of America. We'll talk about sustainable investing, equality in finance, and much, much more. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, in the transition towards net zero, infrastructure and energy companies are critical to addressing the challenge. Bechtel is one of the titans of the industry, founded in 1898. It's on the forefront of tackling greener infrastructure project as well. Well, we're delighted to be joined by the Bechtel Chief Financial Officer, Catherine Hunt Ryan. Thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us. I mean, I have so many questions about labor shortages and energy prices, but you um, are really Chief Financial Officer for one of the you know, mes you know, most well-known and, and biggest engineering companies that has pipelines and all of that. So what's your main challenge right now? When you look at the energy crisis, when you look at the labor shortage, is there something that's out of your control that's really difficult to deal with? No, it's a great question, and thank you for having us today. You know, the, the primary challenge that we see is just the pace of getting going. We need to act now to make progress, and we need to be planning for the future. So the structured position of making progress now on the technologies that are available on the on the the policies and the practices we have in conjunction with planning for the future, making the investments in the talent, making the investments in technology that will bring us to the future. That's our largest challenge at this, at this point. So what does that mean in terms of, is it investing? Is it actually trying to navigate? I don't know how the energy crisis fits in, whether we go into this transition and it's going to be bumpy along the ride and we just have to accept it, or whether there's anything that you can do to mitigate it. There will be some bumps. That, that we're, I think we're, we're confident that there will be some bumps in the road. But what we can do is really to, to take action. So the, while there are, there are bumps of inflation, there are bumps of, uh, of anticipating policies, um, what we can do is get going to start building. There is an, an enormous amount of infrastructure that needs to be built in order to achieve net zero and larger um, sustainability goals. And, but what we can't do is wait for some of the technologies that are, that are not yet here. So whether that's you know, further carbon capture, that's advanced nuclear, we have to continue to study those 
to bring those to, to optimize those from an engineering perspective, to, to test those. But we have to work with what we have, which is onshore wind, solar, um, uh, battery storage and, and the likes to really advance um, the economy, to advance, to create jobs and to bring the renewable future you know, to where we are now. Is there a labor shortage at all for if you're building an infrastructure, whether it be renewable or not, do you have enough people to build it? I'd say you know, globally it is a challenge. We are seeing we are not immune to what, um, what many others are seeing in this market, which is a shortage. Um, you know, certainly pressure on pricing for steel and commodities, but it's also pressure on, on labor, both, um, both uh, manual or craft professionals um, and professional staffing. We do see, we do see shortages. Um, there, are, um, there, are very, there are a lot of people who are interested in, in, in greening the economy and being part of this transition. And so um, we see it as a very positive thing. This is a, a tremendous uh, pull for talented people. But it is, you know, so it's part of, um, for our company and for the industry, it's our challenge to see how to, how to attract those people, how to retain them, and really how to focus them in, in areas that are advancing these net zero objectives. Um, Catherine, overall, when you look at, you know, what Bechtel has been doing over the last 10 years, it was a lot of the export LNG terminals that really kind of redefined the way the energy flows were going. Um, what are you focusing on for the next 10 years? So what is the next big thing that, that kind of, you know, then changes the way I consume or, or pay for my energy? No, it's a great question. You know, we're, we're a company that we've been around for a long time, and what we, we really value is delivering sustainable solutions for our customers. How we do that and where we do that really depends. And so we are active in infrastructure and energy and mining and metals and in government and security. And so we, there's not a single source of where we see a, a, a tremendous amount of promise or growth, but really see the, the, the bulk or the diversity of those businesses going forward. I will say that the number of challenges that our customers face as they are in embracing their own net zero objectives, as they are embracing their own um, energy transition, we see as not as, a, as a, on the defensive side, but as tremendous opportunity. So the markets that are created, the solutions that are created, whether again that's EV charging, whether that's further um, wind and solar, whether that is um, the, the, the rise of data centers and how to, to store and safely treat data. Um, we see this as a, as a tremendous opportunity, not as a challenge in terms of how we grow. Is there a piece of technology that you actually need to see getting better for it to change the energy transition? If I were to call out one piece of technology that we, um, we think would be an unlocker, it would be long-term battery storage. Um, so eight plus hour battery storage, um, we do see as a way that would really catalyze uh, the growth of renewable power and, and enable a number of, tech, of other technologies um, that can bring us closer to, to not only our own company's net zero objectives, but also the, the industry's net zero objectives. So what do you need from, from COP26? I don't know whether there's a definition, a you know, price on carbon, or whether there's you know, just some of the funding to get some of these technologies in place and usable. You know, there, you know, our, I wouldn't say there's one single thing that we're looking for, but it's a continuation of a commitment to move forward, but it's also a continuation of acting now yeah. to support the things that we need in the future. So it is acting now on the technologies, acting now on the programs that we have available to create jobs and move things forward. So we can't wait for the future and to continue to advance the technologies. It's an and game. It is very much so a act now with what we have and move forward with, um, with the technologies that are coming in the future. So if there's one thing we were looking for out of COP26 is a continued commitment to this and game of now and plan for the future. Talked about nuclear, so this is you know, one of the most difficult but actually important subjects when we talk about energy. Do, do you see building more projects outside the US in the next 10 years? We absolutely do. We, we firmly believe that as, as, a, as a very clean source of reliable power, that nuclear power is um, is a part of of, um, of certainly the UK and, and many other countries' um, energy future, and so we have we have personally invested in terms of the talent, the technologies, the processes with our customers uh, to to advance that forward. We also see a bright future for more advanced nuclear technologies, um, but it would be very safe to say that we um, we are we are invested in the future of nuclear. We see it as a as a clean green and reliable source of power in the future. Um, Catherine, overall, and this kind of goes back to what we we're talking about before about labor shortages, do you feel like you have to pay your employees more? I mean, I know you've, you've always paid your employees very well, as far as I understand, but are, are there inflationary pressures that actually are coming through that will have to translate into higher wages? 
We are seeing that, and uh, you know, as I mentioned before, that we are not immune to that. We are seeing that, um, you know, certainly more regionally based as to where yeah. what, what is more acute. Um, the electrical trades, um, I'd say, anything involving you know engineering optimization is a is a is a very high demand, and then of course data science, data management of of, of the 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 variety of information that we now have available. Mm -hmm. um, so we are seeing those pressures. Um, we are also seeing that, um, you know, more so than, than pricing is the commitment, is the culture and the, the, um, the dedication that companies have to make progress and to demonstrate that they're making progress so that our people um, feel part of a mission. They, they, feel, they feel part, they can understand where we're going, how we're, how we're, we're getting there and ultimately what kind of impact we're creating for our customers and for the, the environment in which we serve. Is there a part of the world where you're seeing more, more pressure on those kind of, I mean, I was thinking of wages. Uh, so we're, we're active around, literally around the world and in terms of, of wage pressure, I'd say that there's, um, there's certainly acute wage pressure in, in the United States um, with, uh, again, because we're, we're, we're both designers and engineers and builders, um, we could talk for a lot of, you know, different, different trades, different crafts, you know, electrical trades. Um, we are seeing, though, I'd say in general, we are seeing a, a significant demand for electrical um, uh, craft and elect electrical trades. Um, you think about the influx of data centers of of, um, of, of domestic, of, of home consumption, and there's a lot more electric demand for electrical products and electrical skill sets, and so that is something that, I mean, if safe to say across the globe, we are seeing in higher demand is electrical, um, the demand for electrical crafts and, and trade. Um, but again, I think the other, the other area on the, um, on the engineering front would be really un unlocking and understanding the different technologies that are available. So whether that's carbon capture and sequestration, whether that's um, advanced nuclear fuels, um, there's a lot of attention and necessarily so in terms of advancing these technologies and therefore having the engineering competency um, to understand what to do with that. Catherine, thank you so much for coming in today. Catherine Hunt-Ryan there, Bechtel Chief Financial Officer, joining us for an exclusive conversation. Now, coming up, the LME steps in to try to restore order to the copper market after a plunge in inventories sparks wild swings in prices. That story is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the London Metal Exchange has stepped in to try to restore order to the copper market after a plunge in inventories sparked wild swings in prices, announcing a rare set of temporary rule changes for its members. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Jack Farchi, who also wrote a fabulous book with our own Javier Blas. Jack, so first of all, why are metals falling this morning? Uh, well, I think we've got this morning a bit of a kind of cooling off after this extraordinary run up in metals prices. Uh, you know, I think it's probably true to say that pretty much all markets are trading energy prices at the moment. Uh, metal prices have risen a huge amount in the past uh, few months, uh, a lot because of uh, the energy crisis in China. This morning, you've seen some measures from the Chinese to try and cool coal prices, and that's led to a bit of profit taking across metals as well. So the LME, uh, Jack, has stepped in to tackle the chaos in the copper market. What do you make of that move exactly? So we've had this really extraordinary situation in the copper market over the past week or so uh, where uh, stocks on the LME have gone to very close to zero. So the key thing to understand is that the LME is a physical market. If you buy an LME futures contract uh, and hold it until its expiry, you get delivered a parcel of metal in an LME warehouse. And likewise, if you sell one, you have to deliver that metal in an LME warehouse. What's happened in the past uh, few months is that traders have taken metal out of those LME warehouses to deliver to customers. Uh, the global economy has been running strong and copper demand has been strong and, and, and stocks have been falling globally. And that means that people have taken metal out of the LME. Uh, the consequence is, as of uh, the end of last week and the last few days, you've got only about 15,000 tonnes of copper available in LME warehouses. To put that in context, global copper demand is 25 million tonnes, so that's less than a day's uh, use of copper. And that's meant that there's been this almighty squeeze on the LME copper market. So we saw on Monday 
uh, the price of copper for deliver immediately, rising to more than $1,000 above the price of the benchmark futures contract in three months. Uh, that's a completely unprecedented level. So, uh, you know, uh, Bloomberg viewers might remember uh, the Hamanaka copper scandal in the 19 in the 1990s. Uh, Mr. Copper yeah. uh, sc uh, squeezing the market. Uh, that's that that's a that's a that's that level of the the, the squeeze on the spread has gone ex yeah. in far in excess of what happened then, and indeed uh, far in excess of anything that's happened on record. Jack, thank you so much. Jack Farchi there from Bloomberg, of course, co-author on a fabulous book, also with Harvey Blas on commodities. Now, coming up next, we'll talk banking with Anne Finucane, Vice Chair of Bank of America. We'll talk about sustainable investing, equality in finance, and much, much more. We'll also talk about the markets. If you look at the markets, a lot of the focus is on some of the earnings that we're seeing. Bonds actually holding steady. Uh, traders seem to be now mulling a recovery, although still weighing company earnings and risks from inflationary pressures. This is Bloomberg. The UK inflation rate eases but remains above target, while a drop in the price of eating out offsets some of a surge in transportation costs. Well, Bitcoin nears its all-time high as demand surges for the first U.S. ETF linked to cryptocurrency. And the LME takes action while the exchange steps in to try to restore order to the copper market after inventories hit a 47-year low last week. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So let's quickly check on the markets, and then we have a fantastic conversation on banking and energy. This is a picture overall for some of these uh, futures in the U.S. A little bit of pressure. We're also seeing some of the earnings, of course, mired by energy prices that are going higher. Uh, traders now mulling a recovery. Stocks pretty much mixed. Uh, traders weighing company earnings, but also talking about the risks from inflationary pressures. I'm looking at Treasury yields on the dollar. Little change. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Netflix has posted its strongest subscriber growth for the year, beating estimates thanks to the popularity of South Korean drama Squid Game. The company added over 4 million subscribers in the third quarter. It expects to sign up 8 million more in the current quarter while turning cash flow positive next year. Now, Jamie Dimon has told staff JP Morgan will boost pay for its wealth advisors according to Bloomberg reporting, the JP Morgan CEO dialed in from Windsor Castle before a meeting with the Queen to announce the revamp to the pay structure. The changes aim to encourage advisors to stick with the bank. Gucci's sales growth slowed in the third quarter after the coronavirus resurged in parts of Asia, putting more pressure on the label's new collection to deliver a strong holiday season. Sales at the caring owned brand rose 3.8% from a year earlier. That compares with growth of 8% in the second quarter after lifting of lockdowns drove a rebound. Analysts had forecast a 9.3% increase in the third quarter. And Facebook plans to rebrand with a new name that focuses on the metaverse. According to reporting by The Verge, the original Facebook app's brand may remain unchanged and could be positioned under a parent company with Instagram and WhatsApp in its portfolio, much like Google's structure with Alphabet. Mark Zuckerberg is expected to discuss the change at the company's Connect conference on the 28th of October. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, a conversation on finance, sustainability and equality. Anne Finucane is vice chair of Bank of America as well as chairman of the board of its European arm. Now, she started her banking career in 1995 with Fleet Financial and was Bank of America's global chief strategy and marketing officer during the financial crisis where she helped restore the lender's reputation on the international stage. Since taking her current role since 2015, she has pioneered the company's ESG efforts, frequently named as one of the most powerful women in banking. She's here with us in London for the Bloomberg NEF conference, and she was also attending the Global Investment Summit. I'm very pleased to welcome Anne Finucane, Vice Chair of Bank America, uh, joining us today. And thank you so much for joining us, and it's so nice to see you in person after so many months. Good to be here in person. And you've been spearheading a lot of the ESG you know, advances for Bank America way before finance really took it seriously and did something about it. Where are we now? What does finance need for COP26 to make a real difference? 
Well, I think uh, capital is what finance needs to do, and they're doing it. So um, I was just speaking to a colleague. If you take, just like pick a moment, uh, we'll use Davos 2020, right before we all right. were in lockdown. I would say the conversation around climate, uh, the environment in general was lukewarm. And today you have... I think they think about 88 trillion in assets that are committed to uh, global net zero. Mm -hmm. About half of the asset management uh, that is connected to the future is is committed to net zero. Mm -hmm. That's extraordinary. I mean, that's really extraordinary. And that brief a period of time with a pandemic in the middle. And maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe, I mean, and, but does finance need to go much quicker? So if you look at, you know, if finance sits somewhere in the middle, I would say between a climate activist and a climate denier almost. Right. So they're taking steps, but a lot of the banks are still deciding to, for example, um, fund fossil fuel and, and things like that. Are, how are we thinking about the timeline? Are, are banks too slow or are we expecting too much? I don't think you're expecting too much. I think it's a matter of it's not settled. So we need an agreement on very prosaic things like taxonomy. What, 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 what does a word mean? What is the language? Uh, we need uh, agreement on metrics, on disclosures. That's all coming. And I don't mean coming sometime in the future. I think before the year is out, uh, that will be done. So that's, that's really important. I think that will uh, create a stable price on carbon. Right, which we need. Which we need. I think it could mean a carbon tax or the equivalent of a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. But I think actually if we can just get the carbon pricing right, right, that will do it. But are you disappointed that it's taken this long? Yeah, I'm disappointed it's taken this long, but I'm really encouraged by how much action's taken place in the last just even few months. I mean that sincerely, that uh, just since April of this year, the six largest U.S. banks, global banks, have all committed to net zero. Just to give you a sense of that, for that to happen, every one of our clients has to be net zero. So banking is quite different than everything else. For us to do these three scopes, one and two is your own operations. Right. Three is uh, the operations of the, the entire value change, which means I mean, you know this, but just for for yeah, yeah, vendors for Good. Yeah. and employees yeah. and clients. So for a bank to get there, it means we're meeting now with our clients to mm -hmm. say, you need to get there too, and you yeah. need to get there before us, so let us help you do it. That sea change is going to make uh, an enormous difference in terms of financing of climate change. And is there a danger that carbon offsets actually prolong the transition? So we need a stable transition but that actually it, it gets us to where we need to be in, in a longer amount of time. Well, offsets, as you know, is a third rail for uh, advocates don't like the word offsets, and there are a lot of people in business that don't like offsets. They don't like offsets, so the idea of offsets is you do all you can to get to carbon neutrality, and then that last mile is offset by a um, something in the atmosphere that is uh, accretive to... Uh, bringing down carbon, mm -hmm. uh, carbonization. So planting trees, reforestation, etc. Advocates would say, apart from that, what you should be doing is just conserving. Mm -hmm. That seems sort of unrealistic. And those that don't like it on the other sa side say, this is just a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. that's not really um, creating any real value. Mm -hmm. I would say there is a big opportunity since we all have to get to uh, net zero, and first we have to get to carbon neutrality, and we can't get all the way there in our own operations on day one because there's not, not enough renewable energy, why not take that last 10% or 20%, whatever it is, first of all, disclose it, so be transparent. Second of all, commit to, in a 10-year period, you will uh, lower that, um, that percentage by, you know, whatever, every year. Mm -hmm. And then aggregate the money and create a synthetic offset. In other words, capital, take the cash, aggregate it amongst all the companies and start to stand up very big, uh, bold opportunities in technology and research that probably needs first loss capital or concessionary capital. And then you really will see huge growth. 
Um, and talk to me a little bit about regulation as well. So here in Europe, we've had a number of labels actually for ESG products, you know, taken away or relabeled or re-regulated. Right. Uh, are we going to see that across the board in other countries? Or, you know, is there a realization against amongst banking check, you know, banking executives that what your main job at the moment is, is actually, you know, avoid greenwashing with some of the products that could be sold? I don't think you're greenwashing when you are transparent. So if you have total transparency, let's just begin there. If you have total transparency, it's hard to greenwash because you're letting all the world know what you're doing. They can look at it and they can evaluate. That's one. Two, going back to this sort of common taxonomy, common encyclopedia of what is what, uh, I mean, I think that's what the Europeans have done. With the regulation, they have called what, what something is and they've given uh, certain transparency to it we'll all have to acclimate to that. I don't think the U.S. will follow the EU in terms of uh, the magnitude of the legislation or the regulation. I also think that even if we do have some um, legislation that's passed through the infrastructure bill yeah. or um, this larger package, mm -hmm. that uh, we won't, we just, it won't be as extreme. Having said that, I also think that we're more comfortable with capitalism. So the mm -hmm. idea of putting uh, big funding behind climate, I, I think will happen. By the way, I think it will happen because I think people can make money at it too. <laughs> Always a good incentive. Yeah. And thank you so much, Anne Fanukin there, Vice Chair of Bank America stays with us. We'll talk a little bit more about the UK investment also. She was at that Boris Johnson um, big summit yesterday at the Science Museum. So I want to ask her about that as well. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we're back with Anne Finucan, Vice Chair of Bank of America, and we're talking a little bit before about some of the carbon offsets, some of the things that you're hopeful for COP26. And of course, at the end of the day, reminding everyone that it's really, if there's money to be made, then you could also see more finance allocated to these ESG. Right. Talk to me about banking. And actually, when you look at the pandemic, you've done a lot of work on, you know, um, equality of women in finance. Has the pandemic made things worse or actually better? Well, I think the pandemic is an aberration, so it's hard to say worse or better. I think it was worse for everybody. It was worse for the economy. I do think that there was some recognition that, uh, I mean, I, to everyone's surprise, in large companies, for the most part, we were able to work from home. There was a lot that had to be done to work from mm -hmm. home. You had to make sure that men and women had childcare, at least we did. Mm -hmm made sure everyone had child care, had proper medical help. Um, and though I think we've always thought about that, you thought about it in a new way mm -hmm. because it was absolutely necessary to get that right for people to have a productive day. And I do think that um, to the degree the eyes were not wide open, they're, they're more open today than they were before the pandemic. So maybe there was a bit of a, uh, an enlightenment there. Do you think it changes, I don't know whether it changes the relationship between, you know, the, the top level management and the junior bankers? Because we've heard a lot of stories about, you know, them being underpaid or overworked. Yeah. Or whether it's, you know, flexibility um, for working mothers or how does that change? Is there anything that will actually remain as a positive in terms of the pandemic legacy? I think that's open for um, discussion. I think the flexibility, we're asking everyone to come back to work, most of the banks are. Yeah. On the one hand, on the other hand, I think we recognize that uh, the pandemic did create a change and we'll have to be tuned into that in order to keep our best people. So mm -hmm. uh, at the moment we're focused on business as usual, but we're, we know the business as usual mm -hmm. may have changed. So I know on Monday you were at our Bloomberg New Energy Forum, uh, which was a great success. And yesterday you were at the Science Museum for the Boris Johnson event. And you met the Queen last night. Yes. With the powers, you know, with uh, all of the other right. masters of the universe. How was it? I mean, did, did the government make a convincing argument for investing in the UK? Well, the government made a very good argument for investing in the UK. And they really focused on climate, which is, this, you know, the subject of the, the hour, particularly with... COP26 and hosting COP26. So I thought it was, you know, they had uh, obviously 
the prime minister and other members of government, but they also had mayors of major cities. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting to see the kind of changes that are being made. You had, um, you know, the top CEOs uh, throughout the world, but particularly from the U.S. Interesting to see everyone get on a coach bus to go out to Windsor Palace, so or Castle. So uh, that was interesting, and we we. Uh, the Queen joined uh, briefly, but Prince Charles and uh, Prince William mingled amongst the crowd. D d does that where does it place the UK? I mean, there, there are you know a number of um, challenges to the UK: be it the energy crisis, the lack of drivers. Right. I mean, is there if the UK invites a lot of US financiers and asks them to invest, there's going to be a, a close relationship? You think going forward? I think there's always a close relationship particularly U.S., U.K. So I don't think that breaks one way or the other. I do think we're all heads down trying to figure this out. The, the reality is the world is still fueled by fossil fuels. Eighty percent of the world is fossil fuels. So the idea that we can abandon them today is just, it, it's not realistic. Mm -hmm. So we believe in a transition, but a real transition. Again, metrics, transparency, plans, evaluations, everyone's seeing that. And you know there's nothing that um, gets people going more quickly than both competition and transparency. Mm -hmm. And that's all there. And I felt that it was really underlined yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're also retiring from Bank of America I at am. the end of the year. A, a lot of female bankers look up to you. What have you learned over your, your time at Wall Street? Is there a piece of advice that you'd actually, you know, share with more junior staff? Well, I think things have changed considerably. First of all, there are a lot more women in the C-suite than there ever were before. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that post-financial uh, crisis, if there's any good that came out of the financial crisis, it was a sense of humility mm -hmm. amongst the financial sector. And secondly, I think an understanding that had there been more diversity in the room, mm -hmm. so I'm talking about both gender and people of color, had there been more diversity, I think that there would have been more discussion because there's more discussion today. When you are not alike, you raise questions and that tends to open the windows and bring new mm -hmm. light into a conversation. So I think that's all changed. What's coming up for Anne Finucane? I don't believe you're really retiring. <laughs> Well, I'm retiring of a sort. I'm retiring from day to day. I intend to, I'm, I will continue as the chairman of Bank of America Europe, okay. um, just not as an employee, and I will focus on climate finance for the years to come. Great. So hopefully more interviews in the studio from I Bloomberg. Hope so. Thank you. And for Nukin, thank you so much for joining us, the vice chair there of Bank of America. Now, coming up, the first Bitcoin futures ETF in the U.S. makes its debut as the second highest traded fund ever, helping send Bitcoin to around $64,000. We'll have more on that market reaction next. This is Bloomberg. I think 70% of the coins out there today are garbage and will go away. The question is, just like the internet bubble, which of the companies survive? My son and I lived together during the pandemic and he, he uh, gave me a lecture every day on the fact that I had opined about Bitcoin without knowing what I was talking about, which is certainly true. I can't tell you it's a value, but I won't tell you that you should short it because uh, you know, it's likely to be higher in the coming months. You have to go push out the risk curve and go further afield right. into new things or odd things. If you want to be long cryptocurrency, probably now is not a bad time to get long. Oh, well, thoughts there on the crypto space from some of the high profile attendees of the Milken conference. We'll get onto that in a second. We have Joanna Ossinger also standing by to bring us more on that cryptic tweak by Jack Dorsey. On to another matter. We've just found out a Bloomberg headline crossing, of course, the terminal that Mr. Jens Weidmann of the Bundesbank will step down at the end of the year. So he said in a statement that he's planning to leave. I don't know whether that was expected. Certainly, it's news to the markets. This is the staunch critic of some of the things that the ECB has been doing. He's, of course, an inflation hawk. So we have that statement, which is also published on the Deutsche Bank Euro system, um, saying that he will leave the Bundesbank, which he has headed as a reminder since May 2011 for personal 
reasons. So in the statement, he says, I have come to the conclusion that more than 10 years is a good measure of time to turn over to a new leaf for the Bundesbank, but also for me personally. So that's the very latest on the Bundesbank, Mr. Jens Weidmann uh, resigning due to personal reasons, and he will leave at the end of 2021, which means that the race to appoint a new uh, of course, central bank chief for the Bundesbank is on. Now, it's a watershed moment for the crypto industry. The first Bitcoin futures ETF became the second most heavily traded fund on record in its big debut and is now in a striking distance of all-time highs. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Joanna Ossinger. Joanna, thank you so much uh, for talking to us this morning. I mean, this is huge news. and I don't know whether it just goes back to Bitcoin and FOMO, that people don't want to be, you know, left out and something like a Bitcoin ETF just brings it more into the mainstream. That is part of it, Francine. So it's it, people can now easily access Bitcoin through this futures ETF. And of course, it's just the first one. There are others that are trying to get in, but it does make it easier for, say, a retail person to come in. At the same time, there are a lot of people who are saying, I'm just going to keep buying Bitcoin straight. I'm not going through the ETF. So, you know, there are a variety of opinions, but it does add another way that people can get into Bitcoin exposure. Um, so, Joanna, what are the key price levels for Bitcoin? I don't know whether we look at it through technicals or because of the volatility, we look at it through something else. Well, you can do either. So the main level, of course, is that 64,870, which is the record high from April. And people are really watching that. It's not too far off. It's just over 64,000 now. And once we get past there, actually, I've seen several people say 100,000 is really the next key level from there. But of course, on the downside, we're still watching 60,000. And Bitcoin is volatile. It can go up or down extremely quickly. So we've got to be prepared for volatility regardless. And often when there is anticipation for an event like the ETF, it can go down after you know, pretty quickly. Um, Joanna, what else is contributing to the bullish mood for Bitcoin? I, I know there was a, this cryptic, very cryptic uh, tweet by Jack Dorsey that also kind of, you know, just adds fuel to the fire. Right. And people are speculating. He, he tweeted, I think it was 705742, which is six digits. And actually, that there was a Bitcoin block mined not long after that that had that number. So that could have been it. And maybe he was looking at the all-time highs as well, um, saying it could be around there. Who knows? But um, one thing that is helping for sure is that whales are buying. They've been buying since probably late July. So you have people who've been in the market who are big players who are looking at Bitcoin right now, seeing optimism. Plus, you have a really good time seasonally. The fourth quarter is usually pretty good for Bitcoin. So while a lot of people are usually very optimistic about Bitcoin, there is a little bit even more optimism than usual. Thank you so much, Joanna Bloomberg's Joanna Ossinger. They're joining us on the very latest on Bitcoin. In the meantime, just about three minutes ago, we heard that Jens Feidman of the Bundesbank will resign by the end of the year. This is for personal reasons. So the race is on to find his replacement. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Anna Edwards in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kaylee Lines in New York. And this is Bloomberg. I think we're at a moment in time where we're coming out of the pandemic and there are a handful of things going on. We see the same type of supply disturbances posing some threats to the fourth quarter. What we see from the inflation front is that the situation is going to get worse. And then, of course, we are working on pricing to make up for most of that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. On this Wednesday, October the 20th, our top stories today. Streaming strength, Netflix posts its strongest subscriber growth of the year thanks to the South Korean drama Squid Game.
Progress on Biden's economic agenda appears closer. Democrats make headway in breaking a stalemate on the multi-trillion dollar tax and spending package. And good news dialed in from Windsor Castle. Jamie Dimon uses Queen Elizabeth's phone to boost JP Morgan pay. A very good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. Kaylee, some breaking news just as we came into this hour from the Bundesbank. Ten years is enough at the top as president of the German Central Bank, it would seem, for Jens Weidmann. And he's going to go, but at the end of this year. Yep, December 31st. And he also says that monetary policy must not get caught up in fiscal policy and also that we mustn't lose sight of prospective inflation danger. So we will have more on this story throughout the hour. But speaking of inflation, that is something the markets continually have to weigh. And as for how that shaped up in the Asian session, it really was a mixed picture. A lot of green and a lot of red on the screen when you look at GMM Go on the Bloomberg terminal. Broadly, it was a down day for bonds, but currencies were mixed and so were equities. The outperformance from an equity perspective came from Hong Kong with the Hang Seng up about 1.6 percent. That was led by technology. Once again, the Hang Seng Tech Index rising for a fourth day in a row up about 2.7 percent. Alibaba, a big outperformer, it rose 7 percent. And that is on news that Jack Ma actually is going to travel abroad to Europe for the first time since that regulatory crackdown started. China also taking action on the yuan, a sign that maybe the PBOC is uncomfortable with its recent strength. The yuan now is actually the biggest underperformer in Asia. It was at its strongest against the dollar going back to May, but is weaker by about two tenths this morning after that reference rate was set lower than expected. In other asset classes, China is also trying to get a grip on the power crunch and rein in some of those prices that took Colt futures down and also weighed on the metals with aluminum futures in Shanghai down the better part of 4%. And finally, the global bond sell off is continuing in Australia, one of the big uh, noteworthy movers today, the 10 year yield there up about eight basis points. Now here in the U.S., we're right. coming off of a five-day winning streak for the S&P 500. The question is, can we make it six today? Right now, that is looking pretty uncertain with S&P 500 futures literally flat. We are still seeing some selling pressure in the bond market, though not as much as we saw in Asia. The 10-year yield is essentially flat. At 164, though, is at its highest since going back to May. Oil is losing a little bit of steam, WTI, at 82.26 a barrel. And then Bitcoin also flat after that debut of the futures ETF which happened yesterday. Bitcoin, though, right around $64,000, wow. Matt. Wow, $64,000, getting closer and closer to an all-time high. Sorry to jump in a little early, Kaylee. I was just going through the Jens Weidmann story, and I just want to point out how big this is for Europe. What a large figure Jens Weidmann has been over the past decade, and he's really evolved as well, starting out as an incredible super hawk in the German tradition, worried about inflation, Weimar and all that. Um, he had changed his tone a bit um, as they were looking for a new head of the ECB, but he wasn't chosen. Christine Lagarde is the big boss, and he is now stepping down. So, with that said, let's take a look at European markets. It's a bit of a mixed picture in terms of the benchmark equity indexes. We have drops here in Germany. Not a lot of change in the UK and Spain. You can see Portugal is gaining, as is Switzerland. Uh, 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 sorry, drops in France, uh, gains in Switzerland, gains in Germany, gain, gains in Italy as well. The interesting thing, I think, for European markets is really the individual movers because we've got some great stories here. For the most part, upbeat stories. You've got um, an outlook that's been raised over at Nestle after the pandemic allows people to eat out more and travel more. Nestle had um, uh, the, the best uh, full year sales forecast, the fastest growth in a decade. On the other hand, ASML shares are down and that's weighing on especially uh, the index in um, the UK as the semiconductor uh, maker has the same problems that everyone else does with chips and ships. So you've got uh, good earnings, but ASML casting kind of a pall over the session, Anna, and uh, really I have to say the Weidman headlines really stealing the thunder of, of everything else this morning, at least in this hour.
Yes, before that, I was excited about Nestle earnings, and I still am. You've uh, highlighted the outperformance of the Swiss market this morning, and that is in large part thanks to Nestle. We will certainly be focusing a lot on Weidmann and uh, his role, as you highlighted there, Matt, and indeed his legacy, and the warnings he's given today about not losing sight on inflation, certainly very much at the heart of the market's conversation right now. Uh, now let's have a look at what we are looking ahead to, though, today. President Biden will visit uh, the Scranton, Pennsylvania area to push his infrastructure plan, the Net Zero Future virtual roundtable takes place as well. Speakers include Allianz CEO Oliver Bita and uh, NL's CEO Francesco Steracci. So lots to talk about there. And Matt Tesla is also up, talking of all things uh, green or turning green. Yeah, well, I don't know if you mean green in terms of ESG or green in terms of money, because, of course, Tesla is run by the richest <laughs> man in the world. Elon <laughs> Musk has about a quarter of a trillion dollars. And by the way, Adam Jonas yesterday at Morgan Stanley came out with a note saying um, that Elon Musk could be the first trillionaire. Will be driven, though, uh, less by Tesla and more by SpaceX, um, which I for a second couldn't wrap my head around, but he's a quarter of the way there already. And SpaceX is a huge business that he owns, I think about 40% of. So it'll be great to see Tesla earnings, but Elon Musk is much, much more than that with a fantastic hairline as well these days. By the way, the US Federal Reserve release releases its beige book at 2 p.m. New York time, so watch out for that. And then, of course, Netflix posted its best subscriber growth of the year. It beat Wall Street estimates thanks to the popularity of Squid Game, the breakout drama from South Korea. In the earnings call, the CFO Spencer Neumann said the company saw an acceleration in growth. What we saw as the quarter continued it into September, um, we saw acceleration in our, in our growth, which is what we had been hoping for and expecting, but it was good to see as we got into the strength of our schedule. Let's get more on this with Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie. Um, T-Mac, I'm not going to ask your opinion on the show itself, the editorial on the, on, the, uh, on the product, but how has it helped Netflix in terms of signing up subscribers? Well, they certainly, of course, pointed to it as one of the key shows, along with Sex Education, which has come out recently as well. They've relaunched the latest series of that in terms of driving that demand and new subscriptions. So you saw a beat, as you said, 4.4 million, just below 4.4 million subscribers in the third quarter, comfortably above the estimates of 3.7 million. For the full or for the final three months, they're looking at 8.5 million additional subscribers. That is also, again, that forecast uh, above uh, the estimates. They are saying that they have an unprecedented lineup of shows now. They had, of course, those restrictions around the pandemic. Those have been eased, so they've been able to produce a lot more content. That is coming uh, to play for them. 142 million households, by the way, watched Squid Game, the most popular <laughs> series in Netflix's history. I know yeah. you're not a big fan, Matt, but there's 142 million <laughs> households out there that are, and that has supported Netflix. Yeah, Tom, my household was not one of those households either. But elsewhere in tech, let's talk about Facebook. We did just get a headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal that the UK Competition mm. and Markets Authority has fined Facebook 50 and a half million pounds for breaching an order in relation to its purchase of Giphy. Separately, a name change could be coming for Facebook. What can you tell us about that? Well, that top line ties into what's happening regarding the rebranding, at least the reported rebranding. Uh, this is by Verge, who have reported on this story, because, of course, this is a company that's facing a lot of regulatory scrutiny, as you just highlighted there, public scrutiny as well, uh, given, given some of the concerns uh, around its practices. Now it's looking at rebranding, again, according to the reporting from Verge. So you'd have a parent company, a bit like Alphabet and Google. You'd have a parent company that would include the likes of Instagram and WhatsApp, its portfolio, in that business. Facebook would still be Facebook. Facebook. The app would still be called Facebook, according to the reporting, but you'd have this umbrella parent group uh, that we don't know the name of yet, but it would be linked to the metaverse, something that Zuckerberg has talked about. And we're expecting to get some clarity on this, uh, the Facebook Connect event that happens on October the 28th. Metaverse. I still really don't understand what that is. Thank you so much to Bloomberg, Tom McKenzie. <laughs> e excellent point. Meanwhile, let's head over to Washington, D.C., because Democrats are moving to break their stalemate on President Biden's economic agenda. They're expected to cut or trim portions of the package in an attempt to sew up a deal this week. Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent joins us now from our D.C. Bureau. So, Anne-Marie, what gets cut? 
It's a great question. They're still working it out and we're still learning about exactly what's going to be end up going into this package. But there is a breakthrough and a change of momentum. So first off the bat, something that is likely going to get cut is that uh, potentially those benefits that go to community college. That's going to fall on the wayside. Then you have things that are likely going to stay in the bill, like the child tax credit. But how long it's going to be in there is going to change. So likely that'll last a year and not what the progressives wanted, which is till 2025. Medicare is said to be in it, but still the details are being worked out. That is a big chunk, over $300 billion. So potentially it'll be in there, but it'll be slimmed down. This is what the negotiations are about. If you are slimming down a package to around $2 trillion that was supposed to be worth in the beginning $3.5 trillion, there are going to be sacrifices. And that is exactly what the president was doing yesterday. He was working both wings of his party to try to see where he come down the middle to get make sacrifices on the progressive side, but something that is palatable and digestible for those moderate centrist Democrats like Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Kirsten Sinema. A lot of work still needs mm. to be done, but we heard from Jen Psaki yesterday and she said there's urgency for the coming days. The president wants to go to the G20 and to those climate talks in Scotland with something in his hand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, being here in the UK, there's a lot of excitement about COP26, Anne-Marie, and what it can deliver. And perhaps it can deliver more if the president has shown that he can get through what he says he can get through back at home. It's very difficult for the president to walk in there, especially with a huge team, and claim that the U.S. is going to half emissions by the end of the decade, but not have those details in hand. And a huge part of that was that clean electricity program, giving money to these utilities to switch from coal, oil, and gas to use those intermittent sources like solar and wind. And if they don't, penalize it. That was crucial. And without that, they need to work, have another workaround, maybe a carbon tax. There's a lot of discussions going on in Capitol Hill on what could fill that gap. But for the President of the United States to walk in, he needs something because he's going to be asking huge emitters like China, India, and Brazil to cut theirs. And really what he mm. has said to progressives in that meeting was the U.S. credibility is on the line when it comes to climate. So they need to deliver okay. so they can show the international community they have the goods. Okay, the road to COP26 for you stateside. Thanks very much for that. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern joining us there from D.C. Now, Jamie Dimon told staff at J.P. Morgan uh, that he will boost pay for wealth advisors. He dialed in from Windsor Castle, we understand, before a meeting with the Queen. Let's get more on this and other, uh, other stories moving finance. Then Danny Berger is with us on that. And Danny, I don't know why it makes this story more well-read and more interesting, the fact that he dialed in from Windsor Castle, but somehow it strangely does. It, it definitely does. And we have the quotes from the call that Bloomberg has learned. And my favourite part about Anna is he said, I'm here with the Queen's quartet. And I'm trying to figure out what that is. I assume it's music. And he was listening <laughs> to someone play music before the Queen. But yes, indeed, he calls. Uh, wealth manager says, I wish I was there with you right now, but unfortunately, I'm with the Queen. I'm at Windsor Castle. Of course, there was the Global <laughs> Invest Summit in London, so people met with the Queen after. But really key to what he's done is boosting the pay for the wealth advisors. Now, this has two bigger banking trends embedded within it. One is just this drive to retain talent. We've seen J.P. Morgan do it with other areas, other banks doing this, paying more to keep their staff there. The second one is just how important wealth management is becoming to Wall Street. For example, JP Morgan still saw wealth loan growth grow by 6%. A lot of that was driven by asset management. So these changes really hoping to solidify that. I'll just be here waiting for my meeting with the Queen, Danny. Meanwhile, if you are a wealth advisor at JP Morgan, you're getting paid more. If you work at City, you might have shorter meetings than a bona fide launch break. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that lovely? Jane Frazier saying don't have meetings. Try to avoid them between one and noon so you can go out, you can get lunch. This is one of many moves that Jane Frazier has done at City to try to make it a more attractive place to work. A few months earlier, she said no Zoom on Fridays, but also along with just recruiting, which City says that they've been able to do better because of their slower approach to return to work. This is supposed to help people get back to work. At least that's what Frazier said in a memo to employees that blew Bloomberg has seen saying that basically back to back Zoom meetings, that's not really tenable when you have to return back to the office. That density of the day is what they're trying to avoid, Anna.
45 minute meetings, genius. I mean, who's listening in the last 15 minutes anyway of an hour? <laughs> Danny, thanks very much. Bring back Danny Perger with the latest themes in finance. Now, change is coming at the Bundesbank. Back to one of our top stories this morning. President Jens Weidmann has announced he will step down at the end of the year. He said he was doing this for personal year, uh, reasons, reflecting on the last 10 years that he has held this position at the top of the German Central Bank. Let us speak now to Bloomberg's Carolyn Look, who is with us. And Carolyn, put this in context. 10 years, May 2011, he took over at the Bundesbank. He's been a fixture of European Central Banking ever since. Hi, Anna. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, um, it's, you know, it's a, it's, he's been a very influential member of the governing council at the ECB. Um, so this is, you know, massive news. Uh, it's also, you know, coming at a time where the ECB is uh, soon going to be deciding about its uh, post-crisis stimulus measures. So, um, you know, as we remember over the last 10 years, there's been, you know, many different phases uh, that the ECB has gone through. And Jens Weidmann has really been at the forefront of a lot of those discussions. We know that he was always um, quite wary of, of asset purchases. So uh, there's a big question mark over, you know, what, what this will mean uh, for those kinds of moves going forward. And, uh, you know, as you said, he's he's been there for 10 years. It's a long time. Uh, he says it's for personal reasons that he's leaving and uh he's quite young too i mean we, we could see him pop up elsewhere he's 53 years old so uh let's see yeah li and likely and likely will i mean i'm i'm not going to ask you uh exactly what he's doing next but what's what are the possibilities for jens weidman now i mean that's a good question the ecb does have um cooling off periods so i i believe for you know if if if, if uh, a governing council member wanted to you know, move on to a financial institution, for example, especially one that the ECB supervises, there's a cooling off period of at least 12 months. So I don't think that we're going to find out, you know, anytime soon um, where he's going to go next. But, mm -hmm. you know, the possibilities are, are wide open. I mean, he's only 53 years old and yeah. there's a lot of things he could do. Well, we'll look for clues on his next act and who is going to replace him. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Carolyn Look. Let's get back to the equity markets now and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. One big mover to the downside is Novavax. And this is after a report from Politico that there's been a delay in registering its COVID-19 vaccine candidate with the FDA in connection with inadequate purity levels. So as a result, that stock is sinking 15.3% before the bell. Another downside mover is Vinco Ventures. This was a really popular meme stock. It saw a parabolic surge in August and early September, but both its CEO and CFO resigned last night. And as a result, that stock is also also down more than 15%. Not all bad stories, though. United Airlines is in positive territory in early hours, up about 1.9% after earnings after the bell yesterday. Or really, I shouldn't say earnings because it wasn't profit, but the loss was narrower than expected, Anna. Thanks for that, Kaylee. Kaylee with the movers early this morning. Coming up on the program, European earnings season ratchets up with heavyweights like Nestle forecasting faster growth. A big gainer in European trade today, that stock. Plus, we'll hear from the CEO of SEB, Sweden's biggest bank, post profit that beat estimates on strong commission income, return of cash to shareholders, the European versus the US banking sector. All part of the conversation. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Anna Edwards in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, I want to welcome our Bloomberg radio listeners as you do every day at this hour on London DAB Digital. You won't be able to see the chart that I'm going to share with Mark Cudmore right now, but I'll walk you through it. Basically, what it shows is the move index soaring, which means volatility in bonds is high, while the VIX index is hovering down at its lows for the year. So there isn't much volatility in stocks. FX is somewhere in the middle. We can leave that out for the moment. It's basically the rates volatility that is so interesting. And the reason is, no one can really agree on whether or not we're in a transitory inflation situation or not, or even if transitory inflation means anything at all. Nobody really agrees on the definition of stagflation either. So we're all over the shop as far as central bank expectations are concerned. I want to bring in Mark Cudmore right now, Bloomberg macro strategist, to help us wade through this. Mark, where are rates going? 
Uh, they're going to be volatile. As you've pointed out, I loved your phrase, they were all over the shop. We completely are in this market when it comes to talking about rate expectations. And, and as you say, we're getting bogged down on the, arguing about definitions that don't really matter. Transitory is a useless word, and I blame the Fed for trapping us into a never-ending conversation about whether we're in transitory inflation or not. Look, transitory just basically means it's not permanent. That could last five years, could last 10 years. It would still be transitory. Let's just scrap that word entirely. I want us all to have our own swear jar there. <laughs> As for rates, I think there's more volatility coming. I'm glad you highlighted the move index. I should have done that. It's clearly going to stay elevated, and that's going to drive volatility in other assets the next few months. I think that it might be in, until well into the first quarter, even in the best case scenario, we're going to see rates volatility elevated because mm. that's the earliest we'll see rates come down or at least uh, inflation expectations come lower. Mark, here's, here's another thought. I think it's about to get even more confusing and uh, we take very seriously, of course, uh, tragic headlines around death rates when it comes to COVID and that's something certainly on the European agenda more this week, I feel, than it has been over recent weeks. But in terms of what it means for markets, if we don't know where inflation is going, where rates are going now, add into that confusion about new measures to control spread over the winter and maybe things are even more opaque. Yeah, I'm really worried about this. I, like, I'm on a European tour and I'm going around. Everywhere here is positive about the opening. Um, you know, go out to meet people and people have forgotten about the pandemic. We're moving on. Everyone's got vaccinated. They're getting their boosters. They're all very positive. The, the fatality rates in Europe are really, really depressing. They're rising very, very rapidly. Uh, and I think as we go into the winter season, we're expecting it to get bad, but we're worse than the same time last year. Yesterday was the worst single day for deaths in Europe since April. Uh, and that is, it's not just a one-off data glitch. The fact is the seven-day moving average is rising really, really rapidly. I think no one is prepared for the idea of Europe going back into COVID restrictions, and I think that is a possibility something that maybe could take the market by surprise and something else in the markets that took me by surprise mark is there was so much hype around the bitcoin futures etf am i wrong to be disappointed with the resulting price action for bitcoin I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm completely with you on this. I think, like, you know, if this was meant to be the big breakout move, I think there's a lot of people on the sidelines. If you're, if you're a big whale, you've used these other big hype events as a chance to offload positions. That's why we saw the El Salvador adoption as a, as a buy the rumor, sell the fact event. Same with Coinbase IPO. I kind of think this might be the same. Mm -hmm. But because we're right near that record high, it, there's an extra level of kind of attention on it. Because if we break above that record high, well, then the whales will kind of go, right, we're ready for the next big leg higher, let's target a head 100k, the retail market's going to get excited. So I think they're not selling too aggressively yet, but they're also not buying in on this news. I think that, that because of that technical level, because we're close to that record high, if we do start pulling back, if we don't make it through it soon, then I think we could start getting a negative narrative that this is again a sell the fact event. Mark, thanks very much. Thanks for the update and a few market themes this morning. Mark Cudmore, Bloomberg Macro Strategist from the Markets Live blog. Now let us get an update on First Word News this morning. A bipartisan push to make the US more competitive with China and bolster domestic chip production risks falling by the wayside as Congress grapples with the packed year-end agenda. The Senate passed legislation which includes $52 billion to strengthen the US semiconductor industry. It marked rare cooperation between progressives and conservatives but democratic infighting and the feud with the GOP has threatened the popular legislation and could deepen the microchip shortage. House prices in China have fallen for the first time in six years as the property slump deepens. New homes in 70 cities cost 0.08% less in September than they did in August. Secondary market values declined 0.19%, a second straight monthly contraction. Developers, including Evergrande, are struggling to raise money as buyers stay away. Falling prices may fuel a vicious cycle by further weakening demand. And Gucci's sales growth slowed in the third quarter after the coronavirus resurged in in parts of Asia, putting more pressure on the label's new collection to deliver a strong holiday season. Sales at the caring owned brand rose by 3.8% from a year earlier. That compares with growth of 8% in the second quarter after the lifting of lockdowns drove a rebound. Analysts had forecast a 9.3% increase in the third quarter. European equity markets then fairly flat this morning, just up by a tenth of a percent or so. U.S. futures fairly mixed this morning as we head towards the start of the U.S. trading session. Of, of course, European equity markets really trading off inflation concerns, thinking about the earnings story. All of that still ahead. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards, live in London with Matt Miller in Berlin, Kayleigh Lines in New York. And Matt, big news at the top of this hour. Jens Weidmann stepping down then from his role at the Bundesbank. He's been there for 10 years, or he will have been for more than 10 years by the time he leaves at the end of this year. I'm reading a note suggesting a, a, a less hawkish successor will be appointed. That's the view of one analyst this morning. Your reflections on following this guy for 10 years, Matt? Well, and I have been following him for the greater part of that pretty closely. I don't think he's quite as hawkish as he started out to be. He certainly turned less hawkish around the time the ECB was looking for a successor to Mario Draghi. That may have been for political reasons, but uh, may not have been as well. I think, you know, he didn't get the role, obviously, he went to Christine Lagarde. Ten years is a nice round number. He's still a very young man. He's only 53 years old and stands to have a fantastic career making a lot more money at a financial <laughs> institution after his gardening leave. Why not step down now? Ten years at the Bundesbank, that comes with a lot of experience and a lot of contacts. Kaylee, uh, that ties into the broader questions around inflation and those broader questions around inflation and how central banks fight them. That's still something that markets are, of course, wrestling with. How yeah. are you seeing markets this morning? Well, they're wrestling with that inflation question, Anna, but they're also trying to weigh earnings that by and large have actually been quite strong, really holding in there despite all of the supply chain headwinds. We're seeing that show up in Europe where the stock 600 is only higher by about a tenth of one percent, but that is still positive territory. And what's leading it is food and beverage after those strong results from Nestle. Here in the U.S., meanwhile, we're coming off of a five-day winning streak for the S&P 500. We are within 1% of record highs. The question is, do we get closer to do that today? Right now, S&P E-minis are up, but by less than two points. In the bond market, you are seeing selling in treasuries for a fourth day, down a, a, a basis point, or actually up less than a basis point on the 10-year yield to 164. And within equities, I would also just point to the VIX. We are at a 15 handle, which is at the lowest level since February of 2020, which reflects not a lot of concern out there, at least in the equity market. Speaking of the equity market, taking a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading, we have a number moving on the back of earnings. To the downside is Netflix, despite the fact that subscribers beat in the third quarter and the forecast was also better. Thank you very much to Squid Game. The thing is, expectations were probably really, really high going into the print, which is likely why the shares are still down the better part of 2% this morning. Synchrony Financial down 2.6% after its results. United, though, is gaining after posting a narrower loss than expected. It's up about 2% before the bell. And just checking on that Bitcoin futures pro shares ETF. TF Matt made its debut yesterday, rose 4.9%, but just a touch lower in early hours this morning. Yeah, and I think, uh, Kaylee, the Bitcoin price is pretty amazing today. You showed it earlier, $64,000. And frankly, I think the 10 year is um, pretty interesting at 164, right? It was just over a month ago that we had a 120 handle on the 10 year. So now that we're um, climbing back towards 170, it makes things very interesting. We've been talking about the Fed. We've been talking about the Bundesbank. I want to focus in on the BOE just a little bit right now because the market seems to be expecting a hike from the Bank of England, which would make sense given the inflationary situation that the UK finds itself in. It's got kind of a different situation than the rest of Europe and then the US because in a sense, um, they've shot themselves in the foot via Brexit, but they also have a problem with rising COVID cases. Simon French joins us now, chief economist at Panmure Gordon. And Simon, I wonder if it's possible that rising COVID cases and the rising fatality rate, as Mark Cudmore was talking about, as tragic as it is, could hold the central bank back from raising rates. Yeah, good morning, Matt. Uh, it's certainly one of those factors that the Bank of England are going to have to weigh in against what is a elevated inflation print and one that is expected to go. We heard this morning uh, more than 3% again, and it's going to go to more than 4%, I suspect, over the course of the winter. But set against that is the headwinds to demand, and I think you're right. I don't think there's much appetite within the UK government to introduce uh, legal constraints on what people do, but of course, uh, citizens around the United Kingdom are going to be looking at this data and making their own decisions on behaviour, and that starts to pull back consumer confidence, mm. demand, cyclical activity, and the type of thing that leaves the Bank of England with a really difficult challenge, given where futures market are, markets are this morning. Yeah, good morning to you, Simon. So nice to see you in person, in studio, for the first time in a very long time. Yeah, so it's not just what the governments tell us to do that controls our behaviour yeah. in times of pandemic, it's what we decide to do ourselves. But, but even leaving aside the COVID story for just a moment, mm. 
Governor Bailey at the Bank of England, he's mentioned many times that he knows higher interest rates won't fix some of the things that are bothering the UK economy. It won't find us more people to drive trucks. It won't uh, find more chips for, 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 the, for the, uh, the electrical appliances that need them. So why is he being so hawkish if it's not because he plans to increase interest rates or he would like the MPC to? I'm afraid to be uh, critical of the governor. I think his communications are in a bit of a mess at the moment. Uh, he has obviously put the economy on notice that they will not look uh, through this period if inflation remains persistent over the medium term. This is what he said on Friday. He talked about the medium term, both in terms of expectations and actualities. Mm. But the market has, I think, overinterpreted that to expect the type of rate increase that you would expect if demand was very strong and you had you know, demand pushing inflation higher, but you're absolutely spot on, as always. <laughs> this is a supply-side <laughs> story, and central banks are really poorly equipped to deal with a supply-side yeah. shock to the economy, which is what this disproportionately is. And we see central banks globally wrestling with what can they do in this situation, are the solutions elsewhere. Let me just bring you some comments we're getting now from Christine Lagarde uh, over at the, uh, the ECB, of course, saying that she respects and regrets Jens Weizmann's uh, decision to leave the Bundesbank his decision to step down. He's been there for 10 years, though, as Matt was saying. You know, mm. he's done this job for a long time. How do you think this plays into the more hawkish, more dovish narrative at the ECB? Because he has been more of the hawkish variety for that past decade. Yeah, I don't think it changes things a lot, to be honest. He was a minority voice on the ECB governing council in terms of, you know, I, I completely take Matt's point that he perhaps wasn't as hawkish in recent years as he'd set his stall out to be. But part of that may well be in a function that he was in such a minority on the ECB governing council that he was sort of shouting into a, a bit of a, you know, a, a vacuum in terms of there weren't other central bankers from around the Eurozone um, taking that same stance and therefore actually even if the Bundesbank appoints someone as hawkish, more hawkish, less hawkish, mm. does the dynamic on the ECB governing council change? Okay. I'm not convinced it does. Yeah, we'll see who they appoint then. Kaylee. Well, Anna, it seems to me that the word transitory has gotten cancelled. And Simon, my question for you is, are we also going to cancel the word <laughs> stagflation? Is it not an apt description for the current environment? I don't think it is an apt description, and I'm pleased you brought this up because uh, globally this has been a very, very fast recovery. Uh, normally, uh, certainly post the global financial crisis, but also normally in recessions, it takes around three years for output to return to its pre-recessionary uh, levels. We're there pretty much already two years on, so it's fast. Global trade is about 6% above its pre-pandemic levels. Now, part of that, again, is a function of the rotation from services towards goods. But in terms of stagflation, people focus on the first two parts of it. The inflationary story, tick. Slowing growth against some very lofty expectations in the summer, tick. Mm. But the third leg of that stool is a spike in unemployment. I'm afraid I don't look at anywhere really around the world where I'm seeing a spike in unemployment or indeed expectations for a spike in unemployment and therefore I'm afraid it's a cross on the third and final parameters of the stagflation okay. thesis. Okay, so the unemployment story crucial there. We certainly have tight labour markets in certain places, mm. don't we? Simon, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Simon French, Panmure Gordon's Chief Economist. Coming up on this programme, Johan Torgebe, the CEO of SEB, one of Sweden's biggest banks. We'll talk to him about returning cash to shareholders. We'll also talk about the banking sector more broadly, rising yields, what that means. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in Berlin and Kayleigh Lines over in New York. Now, SEB, Sweden's biggest bank by market value, reported profit that beat analysts' estimates. This is after commission income kept pace with record levels from the previous quarter. Joining us now is Johan Torgaby, the CEO of SEB. Really nice to speak to you, uh, Johan. And let me start by asking you about return of cash to shareholders because this seems to be a growing theme from many European banks and maybe we'll hear more about this over the weeks to come. I know that the FSA, though, over, uh, over in Sweden has cautioned banks because we are not necessarily all the way through the global pandemic and cautioned banks about the amount of payout. How do you see payouts developing with that in mind? 
Uh, thank you for having me. I think it needs to be in the context of uh, the dividend that were proposed for 19 and 20 and separated between what's a normalization type of driven capital repatriation and what's an ordinary one. And the announcement we did today to do an, a further ordinary dividend uh, together with initiating a share buyback is very much in the normalization and outside the normal cycle. We are continuously being cautious. We're not going to redo everything, so we talk about a gradual adjustment of the capital base and right now there are no formal restrictions on how you treat your capital uh, other than prudent okay uh, johan sticking with the earnings release for a moment your, your trading income seemed to be estimates i wonder how much you see that carrying forward into the rest of the year or how uh, to coin a phase how, how transitory that will prove to be when it comes to fees and commission coming from the advisory units, such as issuance of corporate bonds, listing, IPOs, secondary equities, primary, it seems to be a very benign environment. We are close to an all-time high in terms of activity, and the pipeline to us supports that this will continue. There's no reason to guide this down. However, we have not seen the mix in perfect favor of SEB because we would also welcome a bit more transformational M&A and the financings that come with it. Then we have AUM and asset under custody. So asset under management and asset under custody is of course very much a function of appreciating asset prices. And as we've had a very, on average, good quarter, those are also very supportive. And then we have the last fees and commission coming in from payments, which is, of course, one of the weakest areas we recorded in 2020, now slightly, slowly recovering. In terms of transformational M&A, Johan, what are you looking for? I think the um, activity level between ECM, equity capital markets and M&A, has been very skewed towards listings. It's like the entrepreneurs of this part of the world that have accessed the equity market to a very great extent. The more traditional companies that transform themselves, I don't think they've had yet the confidence in order to make those very brave decisions. And it's to me very natural when you have heightened volatility, heightened uncertainty, you need the boardrooms and the CEOs to kind of um, welcome a more transformation agenda before you go into M&A, and particularly um, um, uh, cross-border M&A, which is one of the areas that we traditionally should be good at. It, what, what about for SEB, for yourselves, um, why aren't you doing some transformational M&A or investment rather than using your money to buy back shares? Yeah, that's a good question. Personally, I'm, I'm always very careful. Uh, I've seen too many M&A deals in the, in the financial market space that are too tricky to actually effectuate in a good way. So we have basically an organic base plan. So we, we are trying to do what we've done over the last five years. It's try to do what we do in a better way and organically expand. So we are pursuing opportunities. We are trying to have a top line growth, which I know is not everyone that can say. We are mm -hmm. definitely never going to say uh, firmly no. We will always look at things coming up. But uh, as a base case, we, we, we think about ourselves as organically doing what we do. Well, speaking of things that could be coming up, last night Handelsbank said it was exiting Finland and Denmark. Does that create any opportunity for you? Well, again, it's not part of our plan, but we will never say never. Of course, if that is now a process, we do have a, a call it a moderate, but still a, a clear growth strategy outside Sweden in Denmark, Norway, Finland, as we do in Holland, Austria, Switzerland, UK and Germany. Um, but we do have a large corporate, corporate investment banking focus. So it's not really retail banking or SME mass market corporate banking, but uh, it's not part of our plan. Well, let's get further into your plans because you are looking at a review of your strategic direction for 2022 to 2024. I know you're planning on revealing those details in the next quarterly report, but can you give us any insight as to what that may entail? Well, I can give you some. Uh, we will try to have a very forward-leaning attitude to do what we do well in a, in a greater, in, at a greater scale. And that's investing in corporate and investment banking in certain areas where we're not as strong. We also have a, a pretty clear plan of trying to benefit from the standing we have in private banking and private wealth management in Sweden and see if we can replicate that outside Sweden. That's a geographical type of expansion. 
secondly, we need to develop digital capabilities for the next generation of, of wealth management. Uh, right now, there is, of course, a lot of progressive firms in the Nordics who show how well you can do it, and I think the incumbent banks have a bit to learn and to invest in. We also have asset under management and asset under custody, so we are having a very strong momentum and a very high commitment to try to become mm. the custodian of choice for financial institutions yeah. in the Nordics. So that's a few. And then retail banking is all about mobile. Johan, let me ask you about the interest rate environment globally. We spend a lot of time thinking about how high interest rates will go this cycle, about where we'll or how quickly we will see Treasury yields on the rise. Net interest uh, margin, of course, uh, net interest income, of course, something that means that banks can benefit in times of rising uh, yields. How are you positioned around that? What assumptions do you make? Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on. This is the most lively dialogue right now. Is this inflation scare temporary or is it of permanent nature? And what does it mean for the narrative from central banks? This have huge implications for the banking sector, not at least in Europe, as we really have a business line of thousands of billions in deposit taking that doesn't generate any significant value right now. For us, the technical side would be very welcomed because we would absolutely have a more normal business if we could have a positive interest rate on deposit taking and we could offer our clients a bit of return on the capital that they put aside. On the other hand, too much interest rate hikes, too much tapering uh, will also risk, we believe, the asset prices. So we believe that asset prices are elevated because of monetary stimulus, QE and fiscal stimulus, and that's the kind of balance that you need to strike. But we are thinking risk needs to be incorporated, that this might not go as well as everyone thinks. All right, Johan, we appreciate your candor and your time this morning. That's Johan Torgby, CEO at SEB. And coming up, Bloomberg is live for the final day of the Milken Institute Global Conference. We'll hear from guests throughout the day, including Entertainment Studios founder Byron Allen, Engine Number no. 1 CEO Jennifer Grancio, and more. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Well, Art Capital Management CEO Kathy Wood says she significantly reduced her fund's China exposure and sees Xi Jinping's common prosperity drive as a risk for investors. She spoke to us about her strategy at the Milken Global Conference. Our first move away from China was when China was, uh, you know, had a very strong move and what, you know, the innovation there was being deeply appreciated while right. ours was not. So that was that kind of move. Um, the second time we moved in, or the, then we moved in, why? We saw the reaction to COVID and we got more interested because it was the most disciplined country in terms of both monetary and fiscal policy uh, uh, during the crisis. And I thought it, that China had the possibility of uh, becoming the Germany and Switzerland uh, of the world, you know, in terms of discipline, monetary, fiscal. Um, as soon as Jack Ma was banished, effectively, right. last November, uh, we started pulling back. Because what we're doing, and especially during February through May, where our strategy, just to give you a sense how volatile it is, our strategy from mid-February through mid-May, most people wouldn't admit this maybe, but this, this is, is how volatile Transpar we are, yeah. transparency. Uh, was down 37%, peak to trough. Uh, so we have come back, but um, uh, during that period, what we do, as we always do, we concentrated our portfolio towards our highest conviction names. China was moving away because almost every week and month, there was a new regulatory move, right. a crackdown. And uh, so, so it was easy to do that. It was great, because I'm always scrambling, looking for cash during a correction. OK, where's the confidence lower? Where, 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 you know, let's buy into some where of these, our right, favorites right. here. Uh, now, common prosperity. So what have we done? No China in our flagship. Uh, we do own some China in um, a few of our portfolios, the ones uh, focused on auto uh, autonomous uh, 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 te technology and robotics. Uh, but we're very particular, very low margin companies because margin is clearly not appreciated by the government anymore, common prosperity. Right. Uh, and uh, 
and very benefic beneficial to tier three, tier four cities, common prosperity. So JD Logistics, JD.com, Pinduoduo. Does it stay this way, do you think, in China for a while? Well, I mean, it's hard to say, yes. but China is certainly a country when they make a, a decision, it's long, longer term, it's longer term planning. Right. And President Xi certainly seems to be on this mission. And I think he is very unsettled that the three child policy is not working. Yeah. And uh, so there is a big social engineering. Um, and by the way, this was all very forecastable, right? I mean, demographics, he knew, they knew 50 years ago what was going to happen. Right. So I think that that's part of it. And, uh, you know, there, there, is, there, is, there are the haves and the have-nots in China like there, are, uh, uh, like there is around the world. Uh, I think China's taking it more seriously because there's probably more social unrest than we now appreciate. What I don't understand is they're going after real estate, which is 75% of the consumer savings in China. Individuals now, in China. And if, if yes, individual saving. If, if the, the prices are going down, which they have been, um, I think that could really hurt uh, consumer confidence. I think it already is. And then last weekend, or the weekend before, uh, the government, the national government, went after the regulators, regulators who had focused on the financial industry as well as the financial institutions. And I'm just saying, wow, they're playing with fire. It's a moving, yeah. And talk about a cyclical risk out there. Think about that if we lose China. At the margin, China has been responsible for a tremendous amount of cyclical growth. Right. And exactly. commodity price inflation. Art Capital's CEO, Kathy Wood, they're reflecting on investment opportunities in China. Quick look at what we are watching then, team. And Kaylee, I'm focused on the UK COVID fight, unfortunately, to pick up on Mark Cudmore's point earlier. Data on deaths moving in the wrong direction. All the focus now on boosters, boosters, mm -hmm. boosters. That seems to be the lesson out of Israel. Well, I'm watching Tesla earnings due after the bell. The stock riding high going into the print. It's up 50% in the last four months. What I'll be watching for is any commentary around the chip shortage in the factories in Berlin and Austin, Texas. Also also, Matt, Elon Musk may not be on this earnings call for the first time. Yeah, I, I'll be paying very close attention to that, as well as Facebook. I got to see what this metaverse video game is going to be like. Hopefully we get a glimpse. That's all from us. This is Bloomberg.